Good morning, good morning, good morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Blessed be the soon, very soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, Jehovah, um, the great I Am, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, uh, Emmanuel, uh, God is with us, all of those things. It's a wonderful day to wake up and be able to boast in my God. We serve a perfect God with a perfect plan, and can't no man, in, no man in this earth and no devil in hell tell me different because I know, because I've studied the scriptures and I've seen the uh, the fruits of, of you know what God can do when you trust Him. And even if you don't, even if He never does another thing, I know God is perfect and He has a perfect plan. Every, everything that God plans to do, it never fails. His word will never return unto Him void. He will never fail at anything. He's never lost a battle, and He never will. So it's a wonderful day to be able to let y'all know, people that are truly walking with the Lord, you already know this is just um, encouragement, just iron sharpening iron. For the people that are lukewarm, this is another chance for you to get right with the Lord and understand that you serve a perfect God and you need to stop trusting man over God. Because a lot of people in the world have already done that. A lot of people have already chosen their side based on that. Um, they'd rather trust man over God. So again, I serve a perfect God, so I don't, I don't doubt his plan, regardless of whether, what it looks like to me, regardless of Regardless of whether it looks perfect, regardless of whether it goes according to what I think it should, God has a perfect plan for my life, for my family's life, for this whole entire planet. Whether, it's your, your, whether your destiny is heaven or hell, God's plan is perfect. So, now His plan from the beginning is not for anybody to perish, but people make their own decision. His plan was to, to give you free will. So, His plan works out perfectly. He, he wants you to choose Him or choose you know, anything else. So at the end of the day, if you choose the other options, then you made your own bed. It has nothing to do with God. A lot of the world wants to blame God for where they end up in life and in, for eternity. So, but again, we serve a perfect God with a perfect plan. And I'm going to tell you how perfect God is based on the scripture. Again, everything that, that I share with you is right out of the Bible. It's right out of scripture, right out of the Holy Book. So, just know that we serve a perfect God. And he is awesome this morning. He's awesome yesterday morning. He's awesome tomorrow morning and forevermore. So, before we get started, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day, Lord, another day to, to worship you, Lord, and praise your holy name. Uh, dear Holy Spirit, I thank you for crucifying his flesh, decrease me and increase you at all times, Lord, bless to be about you and not about me. Bless me to, to, to focus in all the attention on you, Lord, and to get, and I ask you to other, get others to focus on you and not me. Don't see anything that I'm saying as me. See it as the Holy Spirit that speaks through me. See it as the word of God, which is the truth. Let every man be a liar, and God is the only truth. So if there's anything other than that, Lord, I ask you to cast it down and the feet of Christ to be disposed of. I pray that the seed is not taken up. I give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, it's a wonderful Bible study. I love the when we get to do those Bible studies where we get to boast on our God. Well, I get to boast on my God because I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to say we because I don't know what everybody else does, but. I get to boast on my God because I know who my God is. And for those that walk, that are part of the body of Christ, the true body of Christ, you know, the, you know we serve the same God, so you already know. This is a wonderful time to, to fellowship and talk about our God. We should be continually, every day, whatever we do, no matter what, we should be boasting in our God and how good he is to the world. Because you know, we want people to get saved. We don't want people to think we serve a weak, a weak wicked God or a weak you know, God that can't save, a God that can't deliver, a God that can't heal. Because who wants to serve a God like that? That's just like serving the God of the world, the lowercase g, the God of this, the God, the God, the God that God has given dominion over this earth. You know, people are like, well, why does God give the devil dominion over the earth? Because God doesn't care about anything material. God cares about only spiritual things, and He wants people to choose Him over the, over the things of the world. So He allows the devil to use those things, just like He did with Jesus. He allowed the devil to to try to tempt Jesus Christ with, um, well, if you call me Master, I'll give you all of this. All this that you see. And Jesus, Jesus told him, I rebuke you because you don't own none of this stuff. My father owns everything. He created heaven and earth. So if I want it, I can get it from him. I don't have to bow to you in order to get it. So, All right, so let's get on this message. A perfect God with a perfect plan, right? What is perfect? Let's define perfect, right? And whenever whenever I say define perfect, I don't mean let's go to Webster because that's a man's. those are man's definitions. Anything you want to know about a word that's, that's in the Bible and in the world, you you go to the blue letter and go to what the biblical translation is, you'll get the true definition and not what the world says it is. Because the world says perfect is mean you, you like for me to be perfect, I don't I can't do anything wrong. 
I have to know I have never done anything wrong. Now, in that aspect in the world's definition, Jesus was the only perfect man, right? He was the only perfection to walk this earth, who never sinned, who never lied, who never cheated, who never stole. Jesus Christ is it. I'll never be that. You'll never be that. There'll never be another one like him. So when he returns the second time, he's still going to be the only perfect God. The only perfect God that came in the form, in the form of a man and that was perfect in, in the flesh as well. So what does the Bible say perfect means? All right, so I always give the Old Testament translation and the New Testament, right? Old Testament is Hebrew. Hebrew will be H 8549 in the Greek concordance or the Blue Letter, Blue Letter Bible. And it means uh, the Greek word is Tawmeen, T A W M E E M, Tawmeen. And it means to be complete, whole, entire, sound, healthful, wholesome, unimpaired. Innocent, having integrity, entirely in accord with truth and fact. That's Old Testament, right? So New Testament would be written in the Greek, which would be G5046. And it's telios. Telios. T-E-L-I-O-S. It means brought to its end. Finished. Wanting nothing necessary to completeness. Perfect. The, that which is perfect. So, I mean, I'm going to focus on the part where it says wanting nothing. God is in want of nothing. He is in need of nothing. God is the provider of everything, so he has everything that he needs. He is the, he is the provider. He doesn't need to be provided. You understand? Y'all get that? You understand what that means? That's, that's what it means when God is perfect. He's whole. He's complete. There's nothing else that needs to be added to God for him to be finished. Now, people try to add to the, you know, things to God that they think he should do, or that he think, they think he should be, but God is already complete. God was here. The Bible says he was here in the beginning and he'll be here in the end. So I'm saying he's the only one that, that, that's able to do that. None of us are going to be, we're here in the beginning and are going to be here also in the end. So again, that's a perfect God. And his plan is perfect because his plan was to be here in the beginning and to be here in the end. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about some people in the Bible that, that God called perfect. So a lot of people say, well, you can't be perfect. Man, you know, we, we, we all have imperfections and none of us are perfect. Yeah, that, that's because you're going by man's definition of perfect. When God calls you perfect, you're perfect. I don't care how many flaws you had or how many things that you went through in life or where you came from in life. You know what I'm saying? If you were a drug addict, God can make you perfect. If you were an alcoholic, God can make you perfect. Does that mean you can still do what you used to do and be perfect? No. That's that's called being having a sinful nature and continuing in sin. Being perfect means you let God change you once you repent, and his perfection is walking with him. Right? Does that mean we're not going to make mistakes? Absolutely not. Because, again, there's no such thing as a perfect man. But, again... Y'all witchcraft workers out, out there that like to use that uh, that saying, well, we all, we all fall short. They like, they like to take the Bible and they like to twist it. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory. But they use that as a, a, a license to sin, right? Well, we all fall short. So if I smoke a blunt every now and again, God will forgive me. Uh, the Bible also says God examines the heart and the reins of man, right? So he knows what your heart and what your intentions are. So if, you, if your intention is I'm going to go ahead and sin and God will forgive me, that's totally different than you saying, okay, you waking up one day and, you know, you've been delivered from anger or whatever, and then one day you, you just happen to be one of those days where you let your flesh take over and, and your coworker gets you upset. It's not something that you do all the time. It's not something that, you know, that you plan to do, right? That's the, the key word is there, plan. The plan is, we're going to go over the definition of that also, but the plan is something that is devised, something that is intentional. Like, if I plan to go hook up with a girl tonight, God is, going, is not going to see that as an accident, right? Because it was planned. It's just like, it's just like if you look at the judicial system. The ju judicial system is set up, they took their structure right out of the Bible, right? So when they charge people with a crime, like let's say for example murder, they charge somebody with murder, right? There's 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 homicide, there's pre premeditated murder, and there's uh, manslaughter, which is not premeditated. So if anybody knows what premeditated means, that means, hey, I had time to think about it. I had two hours to think about it if I'm going to go kill this person. Homicide or you know, homicide could be something, okay, in an act of a crime or, let's say, for example, you get angry and at the moment you decide to kill somebody. Uh, that's kind of the same. Manslaughter is something, okay, you, you're doing something and, and you know, you're being negligent or reckless and, and you cost somebody their life. Like they charge people with vehicular manslaughter that, you know, they drink and drive because it wasn't. That's not premeditated. They're not saying, okay, I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to go out and I'm going to kill somebody. No, they're like, okay, I'm, I can drink, I can handle my liquor, so boom, I do it all the time. I, I, I go to the bar, drink a few, and then I'll drive home. 
and then you get in an accident, God forbid, and kill somebody, right? That is not premeditated. That is why they get charged with manslaughter, manslaughter instead of premeditated, you know, premeditated murder or capital murder. Capital murder in a lot of states means you can face the death penalty. And capital murder has to have some type of a premeditation to it, right? So it's the same thing with God. God just just based on our motives. So if somebody's doing something premeditated, that's not that's not considered falling short. So we have to know the difference, right? In order to know the difference, you have to seek the Lord and, and, and humble ourselves and, and come to him in humility because I'm not perfect either. I, 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 I do believe that statement. Well, I'm not a perfect person. But do I get up to willfully sin? Absolutely not. Do I get up to do what I used to do and go to the club and go to the strip club and you know drink till I, you know, till I pass out? No, I don't do those things anymore because I know that is willful sin. And the Bible says those that do those things will not inherit the kingdom, right? So, again, that being said, we're going to talk about what God thinks is perfect. We're going to go to the book of Genesis first. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. All right, just talking about our buddy, our brother in Christ, Noah. Again, we're talking about God's perfect, a perfect God with a perfect plan and what God's idea of perfect is. So if God calls you perfect, it don't matter what people say. People's idea of perfect and, and their definitions of perfect is different from what God's definition is. So um, Genesis 6 and 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. Right, so if a lot of people didn't catch it, they would have stopped right there and said it was no and Noah was a just man and perfect. Oh, so God is, God has favor for Noah because oh he's a perfect, he didn't do anything wrong. No. That was that's that's far from the truth. Matter of fact, Noah was an alcoholic. Noah Noah had an anger problem before he got delivered. So the key there is says Noah was perfect in his generation, it means the, the, the generation that he was in, the generation that got destroyed. I don't know if you know the story of, you know, the flood and the ark and all those things, but Noah was one of eight people that were saved out of a whole, just like the earth is full down, the earth was full back then. And God only spared eight people. Think about it. So it's saying Noah was perfect in his generation. First you have to understand the context of where, where, you know, where, where that's coming from. Back in Noah's day was, was the time where the Nephilim came down and they, you know, they entered the, the, the daughters of men and they had Nephilim children, which were not human. They were like half human, half, you know, angelic or whatever. And those were considered, God didn't consider that his creation because he didn't create it. He didn't tell them to go, you know, basically reproduce with humans. So God destroyed the, the whole generation based on most of the generation, their, their you know, genetic makeup. I don't want to say the word because last time I said it, they, they uh, banned me on Facebook for a while and, and on YouTube for saying the word. So let me write it down. Let me see. We're going to be smart about this, right? Hope y'all can see it. Let me write with a highlighter. Noah had perfect. That's, that, that's what was perfect about Noah and his generation. Not that he was a person that didn't make, make mistakes. Not that he always was obedient. Noah was angry. Noah, you know, had issues with what God was telling him to do. He didn't really want to go, uh, you know, he didn't want to go warn people about what was coming because he was like, God, why am I going to warn people about something that's never happened? God told Noah to go warn people that a flood was coming and he was going to flood the earth. To this point, there had never been even a drop of rain. The crops and everything they were they were already they were watered by naturally by God. They didn't need water from from the sky or anything like that. So Noah was like, "God, you tripping? Like I'm gonna go warn these people about something that I've never even seen." But I, I believe you. I believe your plan is perfect. I know that you when you say you're gonna do something, you're gonna do it. But these people are not gonna believe that. So why do I need to waste my time? But guess what? Noah had to be obedient, and he was. That's what made him perfect, and that's what was what was it made him able to be saved. Him and his, you know, it was his three sons, his three daughter-in-laws, and his wife. So eight people total, and that was because Noah was obedient. He warned people for 120 years. Which, by the way, the same way they're doing now, when people like myself or other, you know, true disciples of Christ try to warn people, they laugh and mock and they point and they say y'all are crazy, and you know, they just they make a big whole big a whole big game out of it. And it's good. It's okay. I'm I'm okay with you laughing at me. It's not a big deal. At the end of the day, I care about your soul. I'm going to continue to warn people. I'm going to continue to let people know that these, you know, the, the, the what's going on is, is it's coming back around. The, the thing is coming back around. Um, and it's going to be mandatory. The next time it's going to be worse. Um, they're going to go back to the, the mandatory, you know, thing where they make people stay in their house. Um, all that stuff is coming back around. It's already happening in different states like California they're doing it sparingly now they're just not doing it the way they did it before because they want you know they've already got people conditioned to following their instructions so once it does happen people are going, oh, okay well cool we need to 
this is what's best for us, so let's go sit in the house and, and sit still. Right. So again, that says Noah was perfect in his generation. That means he was perfect in God's eyes because of his obedience and because of what he, you know, his, his, his you know, what I just showed you is perfect. That was perfect. That's why we're talking about right now with people that have taken that have already taken that, that thing that, that changes the you know that changes you know your God given you know I don't want to say all the words you know what I mean I'm trying to use code words because the B system is smart and they're the, I don't know if y'all know but they're taking out videos everywhere of true believers and all that stuff anything we try to warn or tell people about they're taking it down they don't want the truth to get out there because they got a, they have a, a they have a plan as well. They have a device that they're, you know, that they're trying to, you know, accomplish because they have a short period of time to do it. Because the Bible says the devil's going to come down with great wrath in the last hour because he knows his time is short. And his time is real short now. Jesus could return at any moment because 80% of the world has already bowed their knee. So, and again, I'm not, I don't fear man. So whatever they decide to do to this body, I don't care. But I'll never bow to Satan, ever. I'll never bow to their agenda. I'll never bow to, you know, putting any type of poison in my body. I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. Probably roughly, well, all together about five years ago. But in general, taking those, I stopped taking those about 10 years ago. Um, Genesis 17 and 1. Here's another definition or another example of who God thought was perfect, right? 17 and 1, it says, And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Hmm. So what do y'all think that means? When he said when he told Abraham to walk before him and be perfect, what do you mean? You think you think you mean, hey Abraham, you're not gonna make no more mistakes in life? Uh, you from this point forward you're gonna be the perfect, upright person, you're not gonna lose your temper, you're not gonna do anything wrong. No, he's saying when you walk with me, you're walking in perfection. I am a perfect God. And as long as you stay in me, like Brother Paul prophetically said in Romans, walk in the spirit at all times because the flesh will get you. The flesh will cause you to Fall away from God. The flesh will cause people to, you know, to make the wrong decisions. A lot of people say they prayed about taking that thing right there, right? They didn't pray to God because God's not going to tell you to put, uh, you know, to defile his temple. Because the Bible specifically says otherwise. It says, if any man defiles his temple, him will I destroy. So why would he tell you to put something in your body that's going to destroy you? And if you do all the research is there, I don't care what y'all say about science and all these witchcraft people that believe science is, you know, they trust science over God. Anytime you look at science, it contradicts the word of God all the time, every single time. Like all the other believe in NASA is real. It's not. It never happens. You you don't see anywhere in the Bible where anybody goes in outer space. It's not possible. So stop believing everything out here. Stop believing all this witchcraft they put on the television. The world is a stage. Everything they do is planned and calculated. Everything that we watch, including sports, which I love. Like I know that all of it's everything is scripted. Everything on the. the Pro level, that's televised, everything that you can see with your eyes is scripted. Um, all right, so we're going to go to one more. It's going to be Job, right? Do another one. These are three men that walked with the Lord, but they all had imperfections, but God called them all perfect, right? So when those people say, you can't be perfect, no such thing. Stop listening to them Bible thumpers. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay, well, you tell them to open their Bible and look at how many men that God called perfect. And see, when I say, when I say be, you know, us being perfect, that don't mean that I think, I'm not going to do any wrong, or right? I'm better than you. No, I'm by, by far not better than you. That's why I need Jesus Christ. If I was better than you, I wouldn't need anybody. I could just do it myself. Like a lot of y'all think y'all can. You know, I'm not perfect. That's why I need Jesus. Because uh, otherwise, you know, I've been, there's been plenty of times where I could have ended up dead or in jail or, you know, a whole lot of other things if I just continued to follow my flesh. Right? Find my brother, Joe. Mm -hmm. We're talking about being perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect in all your ways. When the ways of a man's ways please the Lord, then you are you considered perfect. That's why all these men, God called them all perfect, right? Because Job, if y'all know the story of Job, God uh, the, God allowed Satan to test Job. Because he said, mm -hmm. basically he tried to bet God. He's like, I bet you if, uh, you know, I'm just paraphrasing. He didn't actually say that. So for all y'all, you know, try to be theolo theologians that want to be try to be politically correct, I'm just... Using this as like an example, it's not actually in the Bible. He didn't actually say, I bet you. He was just saying, telling God, I know that you don't truly think this man is going to serve you if you take everything away from him, do you? And God was like, I know, I know, I, know. I created him, I know he will. So basically, long story short, he allowed the devil to you know, test Job to take everything that he had, including his health. 
So it was had mad riches. He had a wonderful family. He had all the land he could, you know, ever want. Um, he had everything. God allowed the devil to take everything away. And he said, I bet you he'll curse you. And Job said, you know, God, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. So even when he was at his lowest point, he had, they took his health, they took his money, they took his family. His kids died tragically. His wife died. Um, his whole first family was destroyed. Right? So Job had to make a choice, right? He, even Job's wife was like, why don't you curse God and die? Like when he was sick, he was like, you speak like a foolish woman. Like, why would I turn my back on the Almighty God? I don't care what I don't care what I go through in life. I know I serve a perfect God, and my destiny and my and my main goal is not to be prosperous here on earth. You know, God will allow that to happen. My main goal is to inherit the kingdom, which that's eternal prosperity, right? That means we get to inherit the, the true land. When the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth, it's not talking about this physical realm that we live in now. It's not talking about this wicked world. Nobody wants this. I don't want it. I don't know about y'all, but I want the, the the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom that's coming. That's what God is talking about. He's not talking about this earth that you see, but you got the lukewarm out there that believe that. Oh, the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. So I'm about to get all this property over here that the, you know, this man owned, all these rich people, we're about to get all the stuff they got. I don't want the stuff they got. They can have it. Because the Bible says it's, it's easier for a rich, it's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's right there, lets you know that a lot of rich people are going to perish because of their money. Because they trust their money, not because money's evil. Money's not bad. God created money as well, and He created it for good use. But you got people that take that and make it and turn it into an idol, turn it into a god, and they trust the money over God. And you got all these wicked people that, that, that are, you know, the, the Bible, the Revelation calls the merchants. And if you look at merchants, that, those are the people that have the money, the people that have the power, the people that are making all these decisions and doing up and all this wicked stuff out there, like these, uh, these, these cars and this Nephilim system, all these different things that, you know, are going to work against us eventually. Wicked man created that. And they, God, you know, the God of this world gave them that type of intelligence. And again, if you study the Nephilim, it tells, it tells you that the Nephilim gave people that, you know, gave man that kind of knowledge to create weapons and all these different things. And that wasn't God. God didn't create anything for wickedness. I mean, he did create people, and people came up with, with wicked ideas. But Again, we serve a perfect God, so I don't question this plan. And people are like, "Why God allowed this? Why did Why did God allow sin in the first place? Why did God allow Satan to, you know, Satan to to, to to try to overthrow him and all this and all that?" Like, I don't question God. I don't. My my my, my goal is getting in heaven. I, don't, I can care less about none of that other stuff. Whatever God decided to do, that's what He decided to do. He don't have to answer to me. He don't have to answer to you. He's not going to. So you can ask all the hateful, angry questions you want. The best bet is to, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All right, so Job was a perfect man, right? Job 1 and 8. Job 1 and 8 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, and a perfect, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? God just called no, no, he called Job perfect, didn't he? He said, Satan, have you, are you, are you like considering trying to take my servant? He's perfect. He's not going. He's not. He's not thinking about you. He's not thinking about sin. He's not thinking about doing anything evil. And that's when the Satan went on to say, "Okay, well, God, let me you know, go. Let me test him then." God said, "You can do whatever you want. You just can't take his life." That's what you read. If you read, that's exactly what God said. You can do whatever you want to him, but you just can't take his life. He got sick to the point where he felt like he wanted to die. Though he got the uh, those sores that they had back then. I forgot what it's called. It was like one of the worst plagues ever. Like one of the worst diseases. But like Job got that and his skin was like horrible and he was sick all the time. He was like, he just wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't some ideal position to be in. But guess what? He said, Lord, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Why would he still trust God after that? Because you serve a perfect God with a perfect plan. And Job knew that. He knew that. Job knew it. Abraham knew it. Noah knew it. All the disciples before us, they all knew it. And none of them would reject God. Even the 12 disciples, when they walked with Jesus Christ, Jesus said, you know, was it John 6 and 66? When John, people don't realize there was more than just 12 disciples. There were probably upwards of probably 5,000 disciples in the beginning. Everybody wanted to follow Jesus until it got rid of You see what I'm saying? Just like now. You got all these churches. You got a church on every corner. You got 50,000 denominations. You got everybody said they're Christians. Everybody followed Jesus Christ until they get rid of them. When they started throwing folks in prison, like they're doing in China, when they start throwing, you know, put people in these camps for, for not denouncing Jesus Christ, it's going to get real, and you're going to see how many people truly want to follow Jesus. Then they're going to say, Psh, 
Jesus, okay, it's just a Bible. It's just a, you know, it's just a fictional God that somebody made up anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm good. No, you, no, I don't. Jesus who? No, I don't know. No, I'm good. Just like Peter did, God, you know, but God was able to restore Peter. Thank God. Um, but Peter did deny Jesus three times, and he told him he would. Just like he said that many people won't deny him in hand. He said there's going to be many people that are going to deny me. <laughs> and he said, if you deny me before man, I deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. And that was for this generation. Peter was blessed to be able to be restored. I don't know if Jesus is going to do that in the end because he said otherwise. So I personally don't want to risk it. So I asked the Lord to, to fill me up every day. If, it's, if I got to go to prison, if I got to go, you know, if I got to give up this, this job, this life, whatever I got to give up for Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask you to fill me up until, when it's time to make that decision because you can't make that decision in the flesh, not the right one. You're going to make the wrong one. I'll, I'll make the wrong one. I'm not going to let me speak on me. Let me not keep saying you because it seems like I'm being accused, you know, accusing people and then people get all offended. But let me say, let me use me. I'm not, I'm, I can't make it without Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be able to not deny Jesus if I'm in my flesh. Without the Holy Spirit, I will not make it. So, again, you can take that and apply it to your life if you want to, or you cannot. I'll be on the All right, so that was three Old Testament examples of the word perfect, right? So Matthew 5 and 48, you know, Herb, and get to the next section because I got to, you know, I'm going to go over the word plan as well. We have a perfect guy with a perfect plan. So Matthew 5 and 48. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for this word. I always thank the Lord for the word. I, you know, I mean, never know when the time is going to, we're not going to have access to it. Matthew 5 and 48. Right here. It says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Who is he talking to? Like that, you know, the pastor just told me I can't be perfect. There's no perfect man. Everybody falls short, right? Hmm. Be ye perfect, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's not saying that in your own right you can be perfect, or in your own actions you can be perfect, or in your own flesh you can be perfect. That means if you walk with Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, if you take up your cross and follow me, you will walk in perfection. What does that mean? That means, hey, when your neighbor spit in your face, you're still going to show them love. When your people, when the people on your job acting up, you're still going to show them that agape love. When your spouse is not right or treating you wrong, you're still going to show them love. Now, does that mean God going to let you be a fool and get run over? No. There's, there's a difference between being foolish and having agape love. God will... will distance you from people and as on the way out the door you show them the love of the Lord you're not going to you're not going to tell you to stay in an un, spiritually unhealthy situation first and foremost and then physically as well so God is not going to tell you to stay in that situation but again he's not going to tell you to retaliate either he said I am he said vengeance is mine I shall recompense I shall repay so you don't have to go seek revenge for your your daddy not being with you know, in your life is you know or whatever. You don't have to go seek revenge because your neighbor ran over your sprinkler head and now he's laughing. Ha ha. You don't, that's not your job. God said, I am, it's my revenge. I will, re, I will repay. You don't have to worry about that. All you got to do is show the love of the Lord. Show, love your neighbors, love your enemy, and let me do the rest. First and foremost, we want to pray that they get saved. I don't ever want to pray that somebody be, get destroyed or perish or go to hell because I don't want that prayed over me. And I don't want that to be my destiny. So I, I don't even want my worst, or somebody that considers themselves my worst enemy, I don't even wish that on them. I hope that they get saved, and I pray that they make it in one day. I pray that we all get to see each other, and, you know, when we, uh, you know, excuse me, when we send, ascend to heaven, and we you know, meet up in the clouds, as the Bible says we will do, whether it's after, you know, after being martyred or whatever, all of, the, all of our spirits are going to meet up in heaven when we, for those that are truly serving the Lord. So I, I don't wish anything other than that for my, even for my worst enemy. But again, at the end of the day, that's not my decision. It's their decision, what they choose to do, and it's God's decision, what he chooses to do with whatever they do. So I'm going to still show the love of the Lord because that's my job. My job is not to, to pass unrighteous judgment. I'm not going to say pass judgment because, you know, you got Luke Warren out there to say we're not supposed to judge either. The Bible specifically says use righteous judgment. So if it says use righteous judgment, that means you're supposed to judge because they judge every matter. The Bible says why do you not judge every matter? The Bible says why do you not judge people's fruit? And when I judge people's fruit, that's not judging people. That's judging your fruit. If somebody's judging my fruit, that's not them saying, hey, I'm going to hell. No, that's saying, hey, if you don't stop what you're doing, the Bible says you're going to hell, not me. So maybe maybe, maybe people need to throw that in there so that way it doesn't look like we're sending you to hell because we don't have the power. I don't have no kind of authority to put you in a hell or, or, or to keep you out of one. The only thing I can do is to keep you out of hell is to give you this word. And it's not my word, it's God's word. So again, 
everything points back to our Savior, the, the, the perfect God, the one that I love, the one that I wake up every day, and I thank every day for the borrowed breath that's in my body because you realize the breath that you breathe is borrowed. It's not yours. It came from God's very own lungs. Every single day, he breathes breath into your life, into your body. So, something to think about when you wake up tomorrow, if you decide you want to complain. Oh, I want to go to work today. Oh, my goodness. I went, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. Yeah, you could be eternally asleep, and you could be <laughs> damned to the lake of fire. Well, God could have woke you up this morning to have another opportunity to repent and to fix whatever needs to be fixed, just like he did me. I got a lot of things in my life I need to fix. You know? I can't fix them without God. So he woke me up so that I can turn back to him and say, hey, Lord, can you help me? I need help in this, in this area. I can't deal with these people that work in my flesh. I got I need you to be there. Otherwise, I'm going to lose my job and maybe lose my freedom. I don't know. You know, that's how that's just being real. Like, like I'm not trying to sound hard or nothing like that, but that's how your flesh will do. It will cause you to do things that you don't even normally do. So, all right, Luke 1 and 3. Let's keep the party going. We're talking about a perfect God with a perfect plan. Again, if you don't already know this God, I, I highly recommend you get to know him. A lot of people that say they know God, but then they're like, well, 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 I was sick last week. I don't know why God let me get sick. Why, why, why? The Bible said we're supposed to ask why not. Like, if God don't allow you to go through something, that means he ain't paying you no mind. I'm saying, I want God to pay me attention. God, I want God to elevate me. In order to elevate me, he has to let me go through something, right? Or he has to take me through something because he's going to be with me. Right? If he don't take you through nothing, if you got a perfect life, you should be afraid. Luke 1 and 3 says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee, in, un, in order, most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus. So in order for Luke to write what he was writing to this, this person, or to these people, he had to have perfect understanding, right? And I've come to understand through study and through prayer, fasting, and all glory to Christ, that the Holy Spirit is understanding. The Holy Spirit gives understanding. So in order for him to have perfect understanding, it had to come from the Holy Spirit, it had to come from God. Your true, your, your worldly understanding is not perfect. Because, again, you got a lot of people right now that think they understand what the mark of the beast is, but they don't. They have a, a uh, deceived understanding because they think, okay, Tim LaHaye in the Left Behind series said it's going to be a barcode right here. It's going to be a dude standing on the news saying, take the barcode right here. Yeah, the devil's really that dumb. That's that's exactly, yeah, he's really that stupid. I don't know if y'all read the Bible, but the Bible says the devil is wise. Like, why, if he's trying to win, if he's trying to get souls, like, why would he do something obvious? For you to say, oh, I'm not a, that's the mark of the beast. I'm not taking that. Like, it's a no brand. Like, people don't think. Like, it's, it's really sad to see how people really don't think. They don't use any type of uh, discernment. In order to have discernment, they have to have the Holy Spirit. So, people don't seek God. That's the, the main problem. They don't seek this perfect God who had a perfect plan from the beginning. If you just ask God a question, God, God specifically said you have not because you ask not. Or you got to ask God and say, Lord, show me through the scripture how this thing. Is the, the, the is the mark of the beast because it is. People keep saying, Y'all know, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. This hadn't happened and we haven't seen this happen yet. And no one in the Bible doesn't say every prophecy you're going to be able to see. Prophecy started in the beginning when Jesus walked the earth. Did y'all know that? And again, that's all glory to Christ through the Holy Spirit, through my, me studying and through you know, other elders that I've learned from that truly walk with the Lord. Because you can tell about people's truth, they truly walk with the Lord. And you can tell about when they. If, they, if they're a truly prophetic person or their prophecies come from God because they are, they will come to pass. God's prophecies will never never be a lie. If you got a prophet that says something will happen and it doesn't happen, it didn't come from God. And the, brother, the, the one brother in Christ that I can and that I can you know, refer to that I'm talking about, I trust, we've, we've been watching him for eight years. And everything that he said that the Lord showed him has come to pass. In 2015, he talked about that thing right there being the, being the, the fall of the, the, whole, the whole earth. The whole world. And what is this? What is this thing doing? It's all all around the earth. And people being deceived, thinking that it's something good, and then they, they're lifting it up as the savior. If you go look at all these different, um, they've done ads and commercials saying that it's the Messiah, it's the only hope, it's the it's the savior. Like, are you serious? Like all these things that are these are names that belong to Jesus Christ. These are names that belong to Almighty God, right? But they've given it to a man-made chemical. But again, you won't get people to see, understand that because they don't they don't have the spirit of discernment. They don't walk in the spirits. So they think they were all conspiracy theorists because all this stuff is a coincidence. They just this stuff is nothing that they're doing. It's not calculated. It just happened so happened that they want to use that terminology. They want to say Messiah because they just feel like saying it. And they're not mocking God at all. Yeah. Alright, so the last one is gonna be Luke 6 and 40. Man, I, I pray this blesses somebody, man. I know 
90% of people are probably going to scroll right by and just laugh and all oh, you know, trying to make get more views and all that kind of stuff. If you look at all my videos, I get, I get like three, four likes, and I don't really care. I'd be excited to get one because, I mean, one person paid attention to the message that came from Jesus Christ, not from me. The message that came from the Word, and they're giving God the glory. That's that's all I care about. I don't care about 7,000 followers or 500 stars. I don't care about I don't put none of that stuff out there. You don't got to give me no stars. I don't need no money. I don't want nothing from me. I want you to give your life to the Lord. That's it. Period. Die. And I don't even have to see that. I mean, that's something that I don't have to see. I'm just, I just pray that it happens. Um, Luke 6 and 40 says, this, the, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be his master, shall be as his master. Here you go with this perfect stuff again. How do you, why does he keep saying a person can be perfect? I'm not, I'm not getting the understanding because my pastor said I can't be perfect. My pastor said he's sleeping with the lady next door because he's not perfect. My pastor said I seen him in a strip club. He's not perfect. So what are you saying that we can be perfect? Because I love my pastor. And I, I, I worship him and I follow him. I don't follow Jesus Christ. I follow my pastor because he knows everything. But Jesus right here, this is in red writing. That means Jesus said it right. Jesus said the disciple is not above his master. No, nope, we are not above Jesus Christ. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Or we, we, we said we're a perfect guy with a perfect plan, right? So when you follow in God's footsteps, or you're trying to walk as Jesus walked, the Bible says we, should, we ought to walk in, you know, walk in the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. We're created in God's image. We ought to be like Him. We ought to, he set a perfect example of how to be perfect. Will we do it to His, his level of perfection? No, not even close. But we can be perfect because the Bible just, I was giving you six examples, right? Of how God called men perfect. And it doesn't, that didn't mean that they didn't make any mistakes. That didn't mean that they, you know, walked this earth like Jesus Christ and didn't lie, didn't cheat, didn't steal, didn't ever drink alcohol. It's just said they went through those things and they were delivered. And their perfection came when they gave their lives to Jesus Christ, right? And they walked with a perfect God who has a perfect plan. Right? Hope it's all, it's all making sense now. All right. So we, we broke down the word perfect, right? We gave you all the definitions of what a perfect person is to God. Now, what Webster says perfect should be, because if you go by Webster's definition, yeah, listen to your pastor, because none of us are going to be perfect. Perfect in, in the world's eyes means you got to be better than everybody else, and nobody's better than nobody. I'm not better than anybody on this that may watch this video or, you know, whatever the case. I'm not I'm not better than anybody. Matter of fact, I'm filthy rags in God's sight if I don't have Jesus Christ. That's why I give my life to the Lord, and I try to walk with him every day, because I know I can't make it without him. I know I cannot be considered perfect in God's eyes without him. You can do all the things in the world, but if you don't, Except Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, God will reject you. God said, those who reject my son have rejected me. And it says on that day of judgment, people don't understand, it's, not, it's going to be far more worse than just depart from me, I never knew you. It's going to be just like being in a courtroom. And Jesus Christ was murdered by people, right? The whole world is going to be on trial. And everybody that's not, that didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and is not... Um, is not inherently not going to inherit the kingdom. God is going to hold them accountable. God is going to say, you murdered my son. God is going to say, you're a killer. And a lot of people are going to stand and say, well, I wasn't even around when Jesus was killed. How am I a murderer? Because when you rejected him, you affiliated with the people that killed him. And that's the word of God. The word of God says that. Go look it up. If you need scripture, I'll put it in the comments. But it says that you will, will be held accountable. Just like if you look in Corinthians when it talks about taking communion. It says those who take communion unwillingly and I mean unworthily will be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. What do you think that means? It means all these people, all these false religions that take communion, they're gonna be guilty of his death because they're taking his blood and his, his body and blood in vain. And what he did on the cross, they're taking it in vain and they're making a mockery of it. So it says they will be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Go read it. It's in uh, was it first Corinthians chapter eleven? If you take communion often, you are, you, you know where it's at. And you've read it thousands of times. It says those who take communion are worthy. That's why it's very important that people don't just take communion just to take it. If you're not living right, I will stay away from it until I get, until you decide to give your life to the Lord. Because that's not helping. That's making it worse. And for those false religions, I would I would strongly suggest y'all stop doing it and and repent of following this witchcraft religions and these false religions and follow Jesus Christ. Because again, you will be accounted as guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. If you're, if you're not walking with the Lord, and you don't give your life, you know, life to Jesus Christ and you die in your sin. The Bible says you will be guilty of the body and the blood. Everybody that, that dies without a relationship with Jesus will be guilty. 
And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be, I don't want God to look me, look at me in my eyes with that fire in his eyes and say, you killed my son. And I'm not a murderer. I never have been. I'm, all glory to Christ. I, even when I was in the streets, I've never had to kill anybody. I thank God that I never had to because that's something that you still got to, even if you give your life to the Lord, it's like you got to think about that. You took somebody's life. But you can kill people physically, I mean, spiritually as well. So just remember, murder is not just physical. It's physical. The Bible says spiritual murder is actually worse. So for those people that are atheists and they decide to make their children atheists and they kill them spiritually and they, don't, they deny them the opportunity to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ and those kids die and they sing, God's going to hold you accountable. You're guilty, of, you're guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and of those kids that, that, that left this earth without a relationship with Jesus because you didn't teach them right. So this thing is way deeper than people want to understand. It's not just about you making it your own choice. Yeah, you have free will. If you don't want to walk with the Lord, don't. Hey, but don't convince others not to because when you do like the Pharisees and you, you cause other people to stumble. Like Jesus told the Pharisees, you, it's not just about y'all. Y'all are causing other people not to get in. And that's the worst, that's the worst, a more worthy punishment than even you just making a decision for yourself. That's going to be enough. People will go to get down to hell for a decision they make about their own salvation, but you're causing other people not to make it in too. And that's why I got that. That's why these pastors are going to be a lot of them that's in, a, that's in the lake of fire. All, a lot of them are already. A lot of them are, are headed that direction. And that's not, again, that's not me judging. That's what the Bible said. You look and read the book, the book of Revelations. There's seven churches in the book of Revelation, and six of them are going to hell. Well, you say, why would a church go to hell? You read it and find out. You got the church of Laodicea, which is the worst church. That's the lukewarm church. And God said, that he is lukewarm the worst. He said, the lukewarm I will spit out of my mouth. I'd rather be hot or cold. Because lukewarm, you're causing other people to think that you walk with the Lord, and they, you're making them think that that's the way they got to walk with the Lord. And it's okay. If you got a little smoking habit, it's okay. You can still get in heaven. That's a lie. Smoking is sorcery. Again, y'all can, believe it or not, you can seek God on it for yourself because trying to get get an understanding from man, you're always going to get in your flesh. Because what I'm telling you is coming from the, from the word of God. It's not coming from me. Because I, I used to have these habits too. I didn't never, I've never smoked, but I did used to drink. And, and alcohol is called spirit for a reason because it has demonic spirits in it. It opens up supporters of hell. It does all those things. You know, people don't understand it because they, they can't see in the spirit. All The only thing they see is carnal. So well, what I'm saying is a joke to them. Everybody's probably laughing right now, scrolling by this dude crazy. It's all these little Bible thumpers on line and want to try to make us, you know, fear monger and all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you the truth. You should be afraid of what God going to do to you, not with you know anything else. I'm not afraid of hell. I'm afraid of what, I'm afraid of the wrath of God. That's what that's the the main thing I'm more afraid of than hell. Because the Bible says there's gonna be people that stand before God, they're gonna be begging to go to hell. Because that's how scary God is. When they, when you find out that he's a real God and all these little mockers that think, you know, making fun and doing all these things. They're going to find out that he's real and the fire in his eyes is real. And he, they're going to be begging to go to hell. All right, so part two, we're going to go the word plan. We serve a perfect God with a perfect plan. So the word plan, which I didn't know, again, you have to look at the biblical definition. The words are not going to tell you uh, the full layout of what God means by when he says these words. Like the word plan in the Bible, like God has a perfect plan, means he has a device. The Bible, the Bible says, and the blue letter says, plan means device or a thought. So H4284, Ashir, means a thought, a device, a plan, a purpose, an invention. And there's evil, there's evil devices and there's good devices. God has good devices and plans. And you got the world that comes up with wicked devices. In the Old Testament, or that was Old Testament, New Testament is G1761, Enthu Masis, E-N-T-H-O-O, M-A-Y-S-I-S. -S. That's the Greek word. It means a thinking, a consideration, or thoughts. Real simple. So we're going to go start with the Old Testament. We're going to have three scriptures. We're going to break, you know, we're going to make it quick. We're going to break them down. We're going to get on out of here. And i got to get to work here soon. I pray this blesses somebody. We're going to start Psalm 21 and 11. Psalm 21 and 11 says... It says, for they intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischief, a mischievous device, which they are not able to perform. This was David when he was talking to God. He said, God, they're trying to come up with all these different evil plans against me. They you know, have evil thoughts about me and trying to set me up to, to die and all these different things. But they're not going to prosper because I trust you, God, because you're a perfect God with a perfect plan. Right? That's what David was saying. He's saying he was just conversating with God. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't concerned. He was saying, God, I already know what they're doing. I already see the plans of the enemy. 
but I know I serve a perfect God, so I'm not, none of this stuff is going to prosper anyway. Isaiah 54 and 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness of me, said the Lord. Excuse me. But when he's talking about weapons that are formed, it's not talking about physical weapons. He's talking about spiritual weapons too. Physical weapons may be, may be the end of this life. You may die, you know, by, at the hands of another man. But they can't do nothing to your spirit, to your soul. The Bible says, fear not him that can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. It says, but fear him that can kill the body and soul in hell. So that right there, God is letting you know I'm not talking about physical death. I'm not talking about a physical weapon. I'm talking about spiritual battles. Except that you can't fight without Jesus Christ. All right, Psalm 148. So we got two Old Testament and one New. Psalm 148 says, it says, Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device lest they ex exalt themselves, Selah. So he's saying that, again, he's telling the Lord, don't let these people's wicked plans or devices prosper. Or else they're going to exalt themselves. They're going to think that they're you know, bigger than they are. And God's not going to let that happen. God, because God, David was one of God's chosen people. And again, he was another one of God, so it was perfect in his sight. But David was not perfect. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. But God made him perfect when he repented. Right? And repent means to turn away from him. So Acts 17, 29, we're going to finish out with the book of Acts. We won't stop till it looks like the book of Acts. 17, 29. Pray for everybody that's watching this live or watching it later. When it's not live, pray that the Lord bless you with understanding. I pray that, pray that the seed is not taken up and that you truly seek the Lord in this last hour or what he has, what device he has for you, what plan, perfect plan. Oh, Acts 17, 29 says, For as much then as we are the offsprings of God, we ought not to think that Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. So saying that we are, for as much as we are the children of God, we shouldn't think that man had anything to do with God's perfection. God, man didn't, man is, God is not made by man. God made man. <laughs> and he destroyed the ones that he that decided to go deviate from the plan. So again, when, when the Bible says God repented of what the works he had created, it wasn't because he made a mistake. It was because these people did, they didn't live up to the plan and the expectation that God has set for him for them. God has a plan and a purpose for our life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. I mean, God said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, which is a plan or a device. Thoughts to, not to harm you, but to prosper you. So God has, a, God has a perfect plan. We serve a perfect God with a perfect plan. And the only way you're going to have to fill into that perfect plan is you've got to seek what God's plan is for your life. God has a perfect plan for you. He has a perfect plan for me. But if, we, if we're living in, you know, in our own thoughts and our own plans, they're not going to align with God's plans. Most of the time. Unless we're seeking God for those plans and we're living out the plans that he has. But right now, today is a day of salvation. Before any plan that God has for you can can go in into can take place or be you know to be implemented or God will allow it to take place, you have to give your life to the Lord. It's today is today. Not tomorrow. Right now. If you if you are walking, you know, walking somewhere, get on your knees right now and ask the Lord to forgive you. Give your life to the Lord. Say, Lord, I, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you were buried in the tomb and rose on the third day without power in your hands. Lord, I repent of all my sins. I know I can't do it without you. I know I can't live without you. I, I turn over my life to you right now. Everything that, I, that that's in my life, I give it to you. Because you, I know your perfect plan is going to prevail. At my job, in my marriage, with my kids, even though some of them may not walk with the Lord right now. But if God's perfect plan is for their life, they will. It's like the, just like the disciples told the centurion guard. They said, once you get saved, you're all right. your entire house has the, um, the, the blessing of God over it and can be saved. Now, that's not going to say everybody's going to be saved because they still have to make a choice. I said the choice is, is right now to be to be made. Don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow may not come. There's many people that went to sleep last night and didn't wake up today. Amen. God bless you. There's, there's many people that woke up this morning thinking that they had the rest. You know, they got till they 85 years old. They got 10 more years, and they 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 got they left out the house and they died at the intersection headed to work. There's a lot of people that didn't wake up this morning. A lot of people is not gonna wake up tomorrow. That's why it's very important for you to listen to this message, and not just the message, but the end of it, 
give your life to the Lord. All that other stuff is irrelevant unless you give your life to Jesus Christ. There is no plan or purpose that God is going to implement in your life unless you give your life to him. So seek him while he may be found. Because we're in the last hour, whether people believe it or not, whether all these Bible theologians don't want to accept the fact that we're in the last days or not. We don't have 10 years left, I guarantee you. And the Bible says no man knows the time, but you will know the signs. And I, I can almost guarantee you we don't have 10 years left of freedom, the freedom that you know. I guarantee you don't have, we don't have time to play with God. We never did, really. But I'm telling you now more than ever, ever God is turning people over to reprobate minds, people dying in their sins. I'm seeing all these rappers in the, in the drill scene that's dying these heinous crimes, dying in their sins, and you know, dig, because they're digging up people's graves and they're mocking people that's, people's deaths and all those things. Like, all that stuff is it's time for all this. It's time to give your life to the Lord and repent and say, Lord, I love you. I want to live for you whether the world accepts you or not. Because the Bible says many are going to choose the path of destruction. Many are going to hell. It's going to be a remnant that gets saved. And I want to be a part of that remnant. I don't know about you. I don't care about being popular anymore. That stuff died back when I was in high school. I don't care about none of that. I don't care about having friends. I love everybody, but we don't have to be friends. As long as you give your life to the Lord, we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. And even then, we don't have to be, we don't have to physically be in contact or anything like that for me to, to still love you. You know what I'm saying? But once I know that you gave your life to the Lord, that's all that matters to me. And even if I don't know, if you gave your life to the Lord, that's all that matters. And I don't mean these lukewarm prayers that people say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Uh, yeah, all right, I uh, repent. Let me, let me, let's go to the club. We'll get some drinks, man. I just gave my life to the Lord, so let's, let's toast. Let's cheer. So we'll get some crown and coke, and we're good. No, that's witchcraft. That's sorcery. That's uh, deception. That's deceiving yourself. There's a lifestyle that we have to live. It's a lifestyle. It's a perfect lifestyle because we serve a perfect God with a perfect plan. And we walk with a perfect God. There's no way we can't walk in perfection. So I love y'all. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Blessed be the soon coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is only one God. I don't care what all y'all say about respect all these religions. No. Paul didn't respect all these other false religions. Peter didn't do it. Um, Jeremiah didn't do it. None of the true disciples respected other false religions because that's worshiping a false God. I will tell y'all I love you and Jesus Christ loves you. You need to repent and get out of that witchcraft and before it's too late. I will tell you that. But I'm not going to respect a, a Buddha, though. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to respect a, a statue. I'm not going to respect a Mary. People that worship Mary because Mary is not a, a bridge to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the only way. Jesus said, I am, I'm a, I am God all by myself. Jesus said, I don't need a mediator. I am the mediator between you and God. So why do I need a mediator between me and you? You see what I'm saying? When Jesus died, he tore down the veil so that you can go to him, which is God in the flesh. You can communicate with God yourself. You didn't need a high priest. So why do we need Mary? You know what I'm saying? This, and that's one of the biggest deceptions is the, is the Catholic religion. And again, I love you to death. I love all of y'all, and I pray it's not too late. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Whether you like it or not, all the nasty comments are not going to change that. You know, all the blocking me is not going to change that. You know, and friend of me is not going to change that. I'm still going to speak the truth of the gospel. And nowhere in the Bible just say you're supposed to respect our religions. So I'm saying you're supposed to call out false religions. You're supposed to call out false gods. Because God's going to do it. And anything that Jesus Christ did or the disciples did, that's what we're supposed to do. All these lukewarm churches nowadays saying that, well, that was the Bible days, and you're not Paul, and you're not Peter. No, they were still disciples of Christ, and they followed Jesus Christ, his instruction. And we're supposed to do the same thing. It hasn't changed. Jesus went into the, to the synagogue and was flipping over tables because they made his, um, his father's house a den of thieves, which means they were selling merchandise, just like you get all these different stores like Mardell's. And again, no judgment being passed. I'm just telling you, if you walk into Mardell's, they got a whole Catholic section. They got a whole Buddhist section. They got all these false guys in there mocking Jesus Christ. But you selling all that merchandise, and you've got a nerve to say you're a Christian store. That's a lie. You're not. You're a merchandise. You're a merchant. That's what you are, and you're selling merchandise for money, period. You don't have any loyalty to anybody. You don't, you're not loyal to any of those religions, whether they're false or whether it's the true one and only true living God, Jesus Christ. You're not, they're not loyal to any of that. They're loyal to that money. So, again, don't let that deceive you because when we go, we, we do shop at Mardell's. When we go in there, we tell them the truth, too. We tell them y'all need to repent and all this witchcraft in here. Yeah, that's what it is, witchcraft. It's not, it's nothing, there's no, there's no Jesus on the cross anymore. I don't know why y'all selling that garbage anyway. Jesus came off the cross a long time ago. <laughs> and he's not getting back on it. Trust me, he's not. He died once. The Bible says he died once for every man's sin. That's it. He's not dying again. But your best bet is give your life to him before you die. Because then people are going to find out that everything we're saying is the truth. And we're not crazy as you think we are. But again, they call Paul crazy too. They say they call Peter. They say he was, what they said, Paul was beside himself. 
You know what that means. You're beside yourself back then. That means you're crazy. That's just another way, a very another polite way of saying somebody's crazy. He's beside himself. Anyway, they can call me whatever they want to call me. As long as Jesus call me perfect, I'm okay with it. But I love y'all. I always love y'all. Regardless of whether I accept the truth or not, the ones that are truly walking with the Lord, I love y'all. Continue to preach the gospel. Continue to walk, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Blessed be the soon and coming. Soon and very soon coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Shalom.